Okay, welcome back to day two of the Justice for Hedgehogs conference. Um, my name is Linda McLean. I'm a faculty member here at BU. Uh, the title of this panel is uh, Justice and Politics One. <laughs> there will be a Justice and Politics Two uh, following this panel. And the order in which the speakers are going will be Ed Baker of University of Pennsylvania, Jim Fleming of BU, Robin West of Georgetown, Hugh Baxter of BU, and then finally myself, I already said a BU, and then of course time for discussion, questions, and Ronald Dworkin's uh, commentary. Okay, thank you. We'll begin with, uh, with Ed Baker, and everybody's gonna strictly keep themselves, or pardon the split infinitive, to 10 minutes each. It might not seem obvious given my paper which critiques Dworkin's theories of equality, liberty, democracy, critiques the restricted scope he gives to interpretation, his reliance on Hume's principle and his interpretation of Kant's principle. But over my career, I have been greatly influenced by Dworkin and I'm persuaded by Hedgehog's general approach in most of its <coughs> analysis, in particular by most of the arguments against the positions that it critiques. Still, part one offers alternative interpretations to his of equality, liberty, and democracy. Alternatives which I seek to show, I'm not gonna be able to go through this in the talk, but in the paper, I seek to show fit together interpretively or more reflective of our basic intuitions and convictions and are more respectful of a person's dignity. And then I try to show the ways in which Dworkin's interpretations diverge from our quite basic understandings. Given Dworkin's methodology, I should end here. The choice between my and his conceptual interpretations can only reflect their respective internal coherence and their respective congruence with our deepest convictions, the case that can be made for each. Nevertheless, and despite Dworkin's rejection of Archimedean points uh, or Archimedean leverage, I ask, is there nothing more than convictions on which to rely to support conclusions? that is, to ground and with which to interpret Kant's principle or whatever principles are basic to morality. Part two of my paper turns to this issue. It argues that all truth is interpretive. Truth is pragmatic in that, it try, in that truth is what provides the most useful insights into our questions or the problems with which we face the world. In this sense, truth is normative in reflecting our aims and serving our values. This pragmatic view of truth applies to domains of nature or science as much as to human practice. And this undermines, I argue, any strong reliance on Hume's principle because there is no bare truth or facts separate from the normative realm of oughts. Though Dworkin is right that our convictions are the only place to stand in the tautological sense that a person when she acts must rely on our judgment of what to do the view that leaves us only with convictions on which to stand, like the view that reasons are primitives, can be challenged. In particular, some facts, the facts of inescapable and endorsed social practices, can provide a factual basis for morality that Dworkin's theory obscures. Social practices are commitments, involve commitments, commitments to ways of life, not merely convictions on which moral life would rest. My point is essentially Wittgenstein's, who observes that giving grounds must come to an end, but the end is not an ungrounded presupposition. It is an ungrounded way of life, or an ungrounded way of acting. By being social, social practices involve the sort of facts, the ways of acting, that should be relevant to morality, at least morality in the sense of what we owe each other. At this point, I examine communicative action, a form of social interaction for commitments that can ground morality, or more relevantly for my purposes, for supportive and particular interpretations of equality, liberty, and democracy. Habermas's development of communicative ethics with its primary reliance on discourse to rely on un universal content, I think has weaknesses that mirror the problems of Kant's categorical imperative. In contrast, I argue that the presuppositions of communicative action involve commitments that constitute a factual basis on which to stand beyond mere convictions. My claim is that this provides for the 
the, the best interpretation of those commitments uh, supports my conception of equality, liberty, and democracy over interpretations offered by Dworkin. For example, a key step for Dworkin is the move from a person's purported inability to reject the proposition of the objective value of her life to the Kantian principle of the objective and equal value of life once begun going well. Then this Kantian principle provides a basis for Dworkin's two principles of dignity. However, the move from according value to one's own life to acceptance of the principle of like and equal value of all lives is surely not logically compelled. The move would follow if the basis of one's own dignity and self-respect is the value of human life in all its forms, but why should that be the basis of one's own dignity? Why not one's membership in a religious elect, the right clan, <clears throat> the right gender, or one's outstanding personal accomplishments? I find in neither Dworkin, Kant, nor Kantian such as Korsgaard a sound logical argument for the move from a person's existential inability to reject her own value or importance to the value, much less the equal value, or status of all others. But within communicative action, the other has equal authority to say yes and no to any validity claim, and equal authority to offer alternatives. This presupposed fact of communicative action provides the grounded commitments to equality but the quality here is one of respect for the status of the other members of the interaction, not an equality of concern for each. The concerns for which agreement is sought can be anything. Thus, rather than Dworkin's understanding of the first pr principle of dignity as leading to an equality of concern as the sovereign political virtue, this grounding suggests nothing about concern, but rather interprets quality as an equal respect for the other's status. I cash out this equality respect in a theory of political equality, the details of which I outline in my paper, but which I note here are in many respects much closer to that of Liz Anderson's than to either Dworkin's or Rawls' theory of equality. Respect for another as having equal status in the collective project the legal order necessarily represents requires three principles, I believe a political participation principle, equal and broad political participation rights, including rights to pro propose and adopt political projects involving particular con contested conceptions of the good, a just wants principle, uh, a notion that, we sh that the community should have concern that each have access to those resources or opportunities that her community considers necessary uh, for meaningful life in their community. And an anti-subordination principle, a rejection of any community projects premised on her or her group's lesser worth or value. Dworkin left liberty as a residual value, only having, o being only the proportion of total freedom on which there is no good reason to restrict. This approach allows liberty to be trumped by any moral or objective value. Restrict, respect for others' autonomy implicit in communicative action suggests a stronger and more central role for liberty or autonomy, for which I try to give structure. One consequence of my view is to shift the focus from the state justifications for restrictions on liberty to a focus on delineating when respect for liberty truly is at stake and then giving it trumping protection. As compared to Dworkin's conception, my interpretation provides a much better explanation of the court's great First Amendment cases, which are inexplicable from the unjustifi and unjustifiable under the court's more recent First Amendment doctrinal approaches, which resemble Dworkin's approach in focusing on the reasons for restriction. As for democracy, speech acts aimed at agreement do not assume that agreement on choices will be reached. Even when it is not, faced with the practical need for action, people individually and collectively should and do act. Using the presuppositions of communication, communicative action as a guide to the idea of democracy and democratic legitimacy <clears throat> requires respect for notions of equality of liberty as outlined above, but not agreement on the content of democracy's collective projects. 
I suggest, contrary to Dworkin, that this leads to seeing toleration, not neutrality, as central to liberal democracy. This leads to a conception of public reason that includes arguments for advancing particular favored conceptions of the good. Likewise, it leads to seeing the free exercise clause of the First Amendment as morally basic, but leaves the establishment clause as merely a possible, I believe, desirable ethical choice that a political community might adopt. In conclusion, I offer an alternative hedgehog view from that developed in Hedgehogs for Justice. Thank you.